don't have to settle for anything less. You don't have to feel lesser than a man. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 442. Today, my guest is Miss Julia Cross. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. And I love the martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. I've been doing it my whole life. And now, it's my profession. Between this show and all the things that we've got going on here at Whistlekick, it's keeping me pretty busy. And you can see everything that we're doing. Go to whistlekick.com. Check out everything that we're doing. From Martial Journal to our offerings for martial arts schools. There's a lot there. And if you make a purchase, anything over there, you can save 15% with the code PODCAST15. Helps us support the show, justify all the time that we put into this thing. Hopefully you enjoy it. We bring you two shows a week. And yeah, it's fun. I hope you're digging it. Let's talk about today's guest. One of my favorite things about the martial arts is that there are so many opportunities for people to find an aspect that really resonates strongly for them. And today's guest, her resonance was in competition. We hear about Miss Cross's travels and her adventures, her competitions, and her growth along the way. Some fascinating stories in here, and I hope you enjoy them. So let's welcome her to the show. Miss Cross, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, good morning to you and uh, well, good afternoon to me. Thank you for <laughs> help, yeah, thank you for having me uh, um, on your on your podcast. Yeah, yeah, well thanks thanks for joining us. Yeah, it, it's funny when we talk to people. Not not only is there the time gap between here and where you are and I'm sure listeners can already guess where you might be based on on the accent. Uh, but we don't know when people are listening to this. You know, when we when we release episodes, they release at my time 3 a.m. So we, 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 never, we never know. So it's, all, it's always funny when I, when I talk to the guests about weather or time, because you don't know when and where they're going to be. And that's just, it, it's four years later, that's still weird to me that, that people listen globally to this show. It's interesting, though. Well, it's good that your audience is worldwide. Yeah, I, I haven't done it for probably a year, but once in a while, I'll go into our numbers and I'll see where people download from. And as you would expect, it's the English speaking countries primarily, you know, it's the UK, it's the US, Canada, Australia. But you end up with these these spots, these hot buttons of of downloads. And I don't know if it's one person or a hundred people or whatever, but you know, pockets in in Africa and pockets in in Europe that for whatever reason we've we've got a foothold there. <laughs> that's you know, Africa's yeah, Africa's an interesting one. That's that's really is worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, because of the show, I get to interact on social media with people globally. It's just, it's, it's a interesting experience. We were talking to listeners. We were talking about that a little bit beforehand. Some of the people that I've been, been fortunate enough to talk to, but we're not, we're not here to talk about them. We're definitely not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about you. And I always start off in, in a pretty basic way. It's the, it's the podcast equivalent of jab cross or jab cross you know maybe front kick and that is how do you get started in martial arts that's always when any time i get interviewed that's always the first question that people ask me um my father actually started taekwondo before i did um a few years before and then he unfortunately snapped his achilles tendon and so he was out for a year and when he was well enough to return training instead of training in edinburgh which is the capital city we decided to go along to a local club that was open in the, my area. And I was 11 years old at the time, and he thought it'd be great for something for me to do. I was a slightly overweight 11 year old and got bullied a little bit at school. So he said, right, enough's enough. Let's take you along here, get you some confidence. And did that, did it work? Did it change you? Well, ultimately, I've done it, I've trained for 33 years now. I mean, it wasn't a, obviously, uh, an immediate transition, but over the months and years that came, yes, like the bonus had a, obviously had a, a massive impact on my life, not just in titles or anything, but in the way I perceive myself and the way I don't want others to go through what I went through at school or bullies and everything like that. So yes, it, it made me realise every time I fell down or something happened, I could always get back up mm. because the strength, the strength Taekwondo gave me 
or the strength I gave myself as well uh, to keep getting back up. I want to install that in not just my students, but everybody I meet. Starting martial arts in, at that adolescent age is, is interesting because it, there are so many people who transition out of martial arts at that point. You get the younger children who, you know, they get to 10, 11, 12, and they start to fade away. Anybody with a martial arts school has probably seen this. I assume it's the same in your area that it is here in the States. But here you are, you're coming in at that time. Were there many other students around your age? No, at that time, I mean, we're talking quite a while ago now, um, there wasn't many children. A lot of people didn't take uh, children on below the age of maybe 10. So at first I had to be all just trained together with the adults, every kind of age group. And when the school got busier, then it was separated into the like, under 16s and then into the adults. But nowadays people are, are teaching from three years old. I mean, I personally teach from four years old. So the, the difference from when I started to now is, is massive. Absolutely. I'm not sure what it was like in America, but because I started in 1986 and there wasn't martial arts for children then. Right, right. I, I started right around that time and I've learned in hindsight that my school was you know, certainly not unique, but rare and that we had separate children's classes. And those classes went up to, you know, depending on the child, 10, 12, maybe 13 before they, they would transition up into the adult class because... You know, of course, the way you're going to teach a six-year-old is very different than the way you might teach a 12-year-old. Well, massively. I mean, there are some places still here that teach children from four right through to like grown men, which I, I don't, I personally don't agree with because children and adults, teenagers, they all learn at different stages and they all need different things to be able to learn. Mm, absolutely. So here you are, you're, you're 11 years old. You at your father's encouragement or, or maybe even request, you start training Taekwondo and you're training Taekwondo now. Did you take any breaks? Was there any? Um, I've never, I've never taken a break no. apart from when, wow. I, when, I, when I've had to, when um, I've had surgeries, I've actually had 10 surgeries. I've just had uh, one three weeks ago. So that was my 10th surgery on the anniversary of my 20th year of winning my first world title. I was in hospital watching my thumb get operated on, going, oh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> so I, I think we have diff different definitions of what's cool. Um, <laughs> what happened to your thumb? Oh, it's, whether it's to do with training for years, but I just had what you call trigger thumb, which means it bends and you can't straighten it. And I'd had three steroid injections in it over the course of a few years. And then my doctor said, no, enough's enough. Because for the last year, I couldn't actually bend it like at all apart from at the, the main joint. So I couldn't make a fist for over a year. So my thumb was just sticking out all the time. So it wasn't the best. But now, yeah, much better now. So it's getting be better slowly. Each day's better. Your, your tenth surgery, were the other nine, were, were they all related to martial arts? Were they all Taekwondo induced? Uh, they were. Wow. You yep. mind telling us about them? I have had uh, three knee surgeries scopes to clear out torn cartilage had my nose broken once by an elbow i have had uh, two surgeries on my left hip three on my right hip resulting in i have two full hip replacements and would you wow i <laughs> i've known people with surgeries and and i'm i'm doing i'm doing the math you know you're you're young for those joint replacements i had my first hip replacement when did i have it 2010 Nine years ago, I've had a, one injury. I was training for the World Championships in Canada, and I was, just remember thinking, this isn't right. Because I was always really flexible, worked hard at it, and then flexibility started to go really fast. I had groin pain. So I went to the doctor, and he set, sent me to a sports doctor who worked with the Scottish rugby team. And he took x-rays and said, yep, you need a new hip. And I'm saying, no, no, I don't. He's going, look at the x-ray. I had a bone spur. I had, like, well, it was basically a mess. There was torn cartilage everywhere. Um, and he said, right, I can do this surgery for you, uh, but you'll have one more tournament after it. And I was devastated. I didn't want to retire. I thought, no. And me being me, I had the surgery done. It was two weeks on crutches. And then I had six weeks to train um, for the European Championships. 
So I did everything he said and I trained and then I won the European Championships eight weeks after surgery. So that was probably one of my, not saying finest moments because I had to change a lot of the way I sparred. But I was so proud of myself for getting back up and having the determination to, when everybody told me I couldn't do it, and I just turned around and said, yes, I can. Mm. And I did. I'm getting the sense that that's probably a core element to who you are, you know, that, that sense of rebellion. Am, am I reading that right? <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, com- well, completely. I was a very rebellious teenager. I tried to do everything opposite to what my parents wanted me to do. Um, so I've always had that strength, the desire to not, to not give up on something I believed in or something I wanted to do. Sometimes always not the right thing, but it taught me just that inner strength and resilience to always, yes, yeah, things get tough in people's lives, but always to say, right, okay, people are worse off. You can get through this. If you need help, go and get help. Don't just try and... I used to try and do everything by myself, like everything. Then it came to a point when I did have the hip replacement and stuff, I couldn't do it myself. I had to, <laughs> I had to ask for mm. help in a, lot, in a lot of areas. And has it gotten easier to ask for help now? Oh, ma- mass- massively. I'm still pretty stubborn. I'm an Aries, which uh, I'm a typical Aries if you follow star signs. I don't particularly look into it but I am an Aries so yes I'm stubborn but very loving and giving and I'd like, I like to help people but if people cross me then I'm not I'm not so forgiven. <laughs> I can relate to that a bit. You talked about championships and competing and it seems pretty clear that that's an important part of martial arts for you. Uh-huh. How do you go from you know just this, this description of, of who you were at 11 you know, kind of sounded like needing something that that could be yours, having this place that you could call your own in in the dojang, to being so dedicated to competition that you're going to defy doctor's orders and compete just a few weeks and and at a high level after major surgery. What what was it you found in martial arts that made it so important for you? I think it was. I did a lot of sports when I was younger, but Taekwondo was just something, like you say, I felt I was at home and I had this family and just, I just loved it. And to be quite honest, it was one thing that I was really, really good at. Like I worked hard and I used to swim in competition and things, but my mum made me choose. She said, you do one or the other. And I chose Taekwondo and I don't regret it for a second. It's given me, travelled the world. I've been from North Korea to... Russia to Malaysia, all over the world. I've saw some amazing things, met some amazing people, and I think I just have this huge family worldwide, all over the world. I call my really good friends, and yes, it gave me a sense of sense of purpose in my life. Instead of my mom, my father was an accountant, my mother's a primary school teacher, my sister has two degrees, and they kept saying, "What do you want to do when you leave school?" I said, "I don't know." I wanted to join the police, then I wanted to be a firewoman. Then it kept changing. And then I said, I want to do taekwondo full time. And at first they said no. And then they said, right, okay, you get a job, you work hard, and we'll support you, but you have to, you have to support yourself. So that's what I did. And then now 20 years later, I have a full time gym. I've taught in the same area for 20 years. And a few weeks after I came off crutches from my first hip replacement, we built a we built a gym my students and I we knocked down this premises and rebuilt a dojang so in the space of a space of a year I retired from competition had a hip replacement built a gym and then separated from a partner after 10 years together so that was oh, a big year because you know <laughs> one of those wouldn't be enough for someone to to face that you just decided you'd stack them all up get them out of the way it wasn't actually my choice to do it that way. <laughs> Unfortunately, it just happened. But when you have all yeah. these goals, it was when I had my first rehab, I was so religious with it. Like every day I did what the doctor told me, every single day, because I wanted to, to get back and be pain-free, because in the end, I actually cracked the femur head mm. um, in my last competition. So when I went to see him again, he said, yeah, you've done it now, your hip's collapsing, you need, you need it done now. So that's what happened. 
Mm. It's a lot to face. It's a lot to face. Massively. Yeah. When did the competition thing start? Because you're, you're certainly not a casual competitor. No, no, no. <laughs> it basically started, well, I was 11 when I started. I think I was 12 when I got my green belt. Um, and I started doing local competitions at 12 years old and just loved it. I loved the thrill of, I mean, I wasn't great at the start, obviously, and then I just kept training. And my, my first international competition was when I was 17. I went to the Junior Europeans in Vienna. So that was my first outing as a, oh, my God, there's other black belt girls here. There's, there's loads of them. They're everywhere. Because in Scotland at that time, there was very, very few of us. We had to go to London or other areas to to have girls. But at that time, you didn't start fighting just girls until you were 16. Before that, you had to, it was both boys and girls together. Hmm. So if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you right, you found a sense of community and a sense of, of you weren't the only female. As you entered competition, you, you, you had examples of other strong women. Absolutely. I mean, I always had uh, strong females in my life. My instructor, that master, Sheena Sutherland, she was my instructor all my days. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away a few weeks ago and mm, she'll be sorry. So, sorely missed. But she's always a strong, independent woman who taught, especially not just men, men respected her, but girls you don't have to settle for anything less you don't have to feel lesser than a man you're not and she taught me so much about becoming like a strong woman mm. absolutely now you, you step out to compete you see that there are other people people to compete against people that i expect were pushing you to get better because you know I, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna take a stab in the dark that you know, you hit that international stage and you're probably not the best person there. Well, the, the first time I went, I won power break in and I got silver and okay. sparring. So, so you hit the ground running. Okay. Not, much, not what most people much, are going to do. No, nope, pretty much hit it running. Yes, I wasn't the best there. But it gave me the inspiration to go, I wanna, I'm going to be better than them. I'm going to just keep getting better and better. Did you have any rivals? Oh, all through the years, I had many different rivals. There was a German girl, they were always top competitors. Um, the Polish girl, um, they were probably my toughest opponents. Because I did patterns and sparring, I did two disciplines. It was obviously different rivals in different categories. Is that common from, from my observations of high-level competitive taekwondo, people tend to pick one or the other. They're either doing patterns or they're sparring. Majority, I'd, I'd say it's more common now, but yes, when I was at the highest level, there was a few girls that did both, but not very many won. I mean, I won um, well, four world titles in sparring, and twice when I won the world title, I won patterns at the same time in the same competition, which is the only, the only female in the world to do that. Well, so many times anyway. And so you talked about retiring from competition. Why? It sounds like you, you, you loved it. And even the way you're talking about it now tells me that you probably would still enjoy it. But why did you step I, back? Because I had to have my hip replaced. <laughs> and it's not just an easy, I mean, I have the full, I had half my pelvis removed, I have titanium all down my leg. Mm. Um, and I have, a, well, I have a sports hip. I mean, it's great. But the surgeon said to me, you want to compete again? I'm not going to stop you. He said, but do you want 10 years with the hip or do you want 25? So I decided after much thought and heart-wrenching decisions that my, my body and my future to be able to walk was more important than stepping back in the ring with a potential that something could go wrong. Sure, and I didn't, I, didn't want, I didn't want people to remember me as being less than, less than what I was. Tell us about your school. You opened a school at a pretty young age, something that I think a lot of martial artists dream of, but not too many people do it. How did it all happen? Um, it was my instructor that actually 
prompted me because I, I was working many jobs and uh, like didn't raise money basically to live and to go travel abroad. Sorry, to travel abroad. And she said, right, I think it's, you should always get to school. So I went to different areas and looked where there wasn't anything. Um, and the, the place I have my gym is a beautiful town called South Queens Ferry. And I managed to get in a high school for many years. And I started with six students and built up. And then eventually, um, when I retired from competition and I had the hip replacement, I decided to take the jump and go full time and get my own premises. So yeah, it's just, that's always been my, well, my main job. I did work at Edinburgh Airport for a while, for eight years being a dispatcher with the ground handling agency. So you're in charge of all the aircrafts. And I loved it. Again, my hip was getting sore when I was walking. I was thinking, oh, this is, this is not good. So yeah, now 20 years, just past November, we opened the gym and my hip, my hip surgeon actually opened the gym. So that was a very poignant moment. It's a nice thing for, for him to come with his family he helped me a lot not just physically but mentally as well when i had to go through all this so now i have this gym and i've got 160 students um i have a couple of well, i have four of my students who are in this the scottish team we're going to sarajevo um, next week actually for the european championships and they're all either well one of them is twice european champion once is a, a european champion world cup champion the girls one of them's a European champion, one of them's a European medalist. So, and my my longest standing student's twenty seven now, and he's been with me since the first day my gym opened. Oh, that's so cool! I know. How how has the gym changed from day one to now? What's what's the biggest change of, you know, if we, if we asked him, you know, what was? Well, I don't know. I'd have to ask him that question today. Just to the, the difference of how happy people are of training in our own place, our own facility, rather than in a high school where sometimes they would put other classes on and not tell you. And we haven't got another place and nobody knew. It's just that we have a massive, a lot of people come to our gym and they say, it's just like a massive family community. People feel safe. There's no egos. Because I always say, if you have an ego, leave. If I don't have one, nobody else does. So, and I think, because a lot of people, when they do martial arts, they go, oh, so you think you're tough? Well, I'm tough mentally, physically, but I don't put that on 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 my CV. <laughs> it's just it's just who I am. Right. Yes. We we talk a lot about ego and culture in the martial arts on this show. And as as a school owner who sees a a, a great culture in their school, for people out there listening who maybe look at their own school and say, you know, I I've got a good a good culture, but it could be better. You know, what are the things that you do to foster that culture? I think it's the way I've been brought up, um, not just by my taekwondo instructor, but by my parents and the people I surround myself in. Because I've never been one for, uh, I'm trying to think about the right words, like people, because they win one title or something, they think they're just this superhero. When no, <clears throat> I always teach me you have to be humble in, in winning and in defeat. I said, mm. because it shows the true person. If you lose, it's how you pick yourself back up, how you hold your head up high and you get on. And I think, I think that's why I install my students, but not just in competition, because they don't have a huge amount to compete. It's, I, I leave it to them. But I always say to the children and the parents, it's, it's good to test yourself, to see how strong-willed you are, what you want to, to do, instead of being scared of something that you've never done. And I think we, I, I teach, I, I give all my students respect. And I think that's important because if you respect them, they respect you. And if they don't, then they just, they have to leave. And fortunately, I've not had to do that. <laughs> I think it's just a, a mutual respect, but they, they know who's in charge, but they can always come to me. We always say to them, I have um, two female assistants that work for me and I've got, a couple of really valued helpers that come along, volunteer, and without them I couldn't do it. But I take advice from well, the older ones who know what to do, and then I'm quite happy to take suggestions on and how to make things better. And I know I can always talk to, I mean, I've got a core of like 24 black belts, 
now and there's a good few of them that are classes, my closest friends that I know if I had a problem, I could pick up the phone and say, can you help me? And they'd be there in a second. And I think that's a true martial arts community that you give to others. Um, they give back, but you, in general, you just want people, I mean, especially children, to become more confident, to believe in themselves. I have a good few students who are either autistic or they have ADHD. We have a lot of different, you know, it can be challenging at times, but the, the, the reward is seeing the difference in them. And even after a few months in the way they talk about themselves or the way they interact with other children, it's just, it's just lovely. And I always say to the kids when there's a new student in, you know what we do, we make them feel welcome. You show them how we behave in class. And so they always do. I think that's a good, good guidance for them in life, not just in the martial arts world. I always say to them that courtesy is one of the biggest values of like our martial art or any martial art, but also indomitable spirit that you, you just never give up when, when times are hard. That's when it's most important to keep going to find your inner strength. Yeah, I would agree. I'm sure through all these years of training and teaching and traveling, competing, you've got a ton of stories. But if well, I asked you for your for your favorite story that you might share with us, what would that be? I won't say it's my favorite, well, a couple of favorite stories, but I think they're all interesting. But my first um, world championships, I went to North Korea. With, um, that was my first senior world championships. Went to North Korea, it was, it was a great British team at that time. And I just remember I had to go to Moscow. We didn't have the correct visas. We all had to run through passport control and then money was passed hands for tickets with this North Korean guy somewhere in Moscow airport. And I'm looking at this going, this is like a movie. What is going on here? So we got on this, we got the tickets for this North Korean airline. And I remember there's a crack on the outside of the plane. And I'm thinking, I'm not getting on that. And my instructor, she's going, get on the plane. Said, Don't be so stupid. I'm thinking, oh my God. <laughs> petrified and sitting on this plane where at the time well, you could smoke on planes and everybody at the back of the plane was smoking and we spent like 10 hours on this plane going to North Korea and I just every minute I thought I was going to die so and then when we got there obviously it was same um, well it still is but Kim Il Sun was in charge and everything everything was staged because countries from all over the world there and every time we went on a trip there was these families sitting in parks waving, eating picnics. We got taken around this park in this like toy train thing. And it was just surreal. And every morning the school children were marching in military uniforms at six o'clock in the morning. These young, young kids, they're looking out your window going, what, what is happening here? And the street, street lights went off at eight o'clock at night. There was no dogs or cats anywhere to be seen. And I mean, none. And everybody had two jobs, one paid and one um, where you had to work for the government. When we watched elderly women laying brick roads, it was just, I, to be honest, I couldn't wait to leave. So, yeah, and every, everybody in our team got sick. Some of them got food poisoning so bad that they couldn't actually compete all the way to North Korea. And I remember this doctor coming in the room of one of our competitors with this huge needle and giving them this injection of who knows what, because he was so ill and he couldn't compete at that time. So I think that's, that's one of my favorite stories to tell people because they, they, you went to North, you went to where? North Korea. Oh my goodness. So that's one of my most memorable, I can remember it like it was yesterday. But it was, it's had such an impact on my life, mm. coming home and thinking that that's a different world. I'd never, known of it, I didn't have the knowledge of North Korea really, and to come home and tell people what had happened, they just couldn't believe it. It sounds like a pretty powerful experience. I mean, I, I, I have very little knowledge of North Korea, of course, other than, you know, what, what comes through on the news. Uh, and, and unfortunately, what you're saying kind of lines up. You know, you always hope things are a little better than you hear. Who Have knows? You been back? <laughs> oh no, 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 no. no. no thanks. You, sounds like you wouldn't. Unfortunately, when General Choi, our, our founder, died, there was a split in our ITF. So the North Koreans are no longer in the group that we're in. 
So there's no there's no need to go to North Korea mm. anymore. My other my other favorite story was the first time I won uh, the World Championships in Argentina in 1999. Uh, I was the only I was the only Scottish competitor that went um, at the time. So my instructor at the time got me another coach, and he's he was from Holland, Master Willie van der Mar- Mortel. He totally changed my life and the way I perceived myself to be. Because I knew I was good. I never had the confidence to go, do you know what? Not in a conceited way, but I am really good. And unless I believe it, I'm not going to win. And he told me this. He said, Julia, you have to start believing or you won't win. Because sometimes I lacked a little bit of confidence when I got there. I thought other people were better. I remember training with him and he was actually coaching the Slovenian team at the time. So I was with them all. I'd been to Holland a few times to train. And uh, we were training the day before we were due to fight. And I did a downward kick and, and ripped my hamstring. I felt it just ping off the bone. And I was in so much pain. I was in tears thinking, what am I doing? What am I going to do? So basically sat with ice in it for like 12 hours. And then the next day I just said, no, this is not, this is not happening. Forget about the pain. Forget about there's an injury. And the mental strength that it took to do that, to forget about it, was, I don't know, it was the toughest thing I'd ever done. And I went there, through all my fights, but the way I couldn't have asked for it to go better. And I had the North Korean girl in the final. And I just remember my hand getting raised and thinking, thank God, that's all I'd dreamt of for years, how it would feel to win a world title. And when I when I arrived at the opening ceremony, all these people were saying to me, oh, it's nice you came from Scotland, you know, as if to say, yeah, you've not got a chance in hell. Well, it was good you came. And I went, I didn't just come here. I came here to win, and I will win. And I remember this guy, I'm sure he was from Argentina. He came to me after I'd won, and he went, you told me you were going to win. I went, never doubt what I say. And I just, I remember that time. That was a good time. Yeah. It, not only does it sound like a good time, it sounds like there was a transition in you. The, oh. up, up until that point, the way you're talking about yourself, you know, I, I can I can hear some things in your voice that you recognized your skill, but you know, as you said, your confidence wavered at times. But this new coach, it sounds like he found a way to get through to you. Without a shadow of a doubt, I've got a lot to thank him for. I mean, I, people always perceive me as this really, really confident person. I am to a certain extent, but it's taken a while to, to get like that. And the, the self-belief part of it, like you, you can train, 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 but if you don't do equal amounts of work on your mindset and your confidence and your motivation, you can just forget it. That's my belief. And I install that in my students that mental preparation is a key, key part to, to winning. And some of them didn't believe me at the time, but now they all do it and they're all starting to win. I'm not saying it's just because of me, but the self-belief belief that I tried to install in them is what I installed in myself and others did to help me believe that I was good enough to get this. And if you didn't believe it, then just forget it, basically. And I'm a true, true believer in that. How do you pass that on to your students? I, I did a lot of um, motivational work with, I did NLP, I did a lot of stuff when I was competing with different uh, people to help, to help with this. And I think over the course of the years, it's been installed. I mean, I used to um, have take all these printouts to competitions with me to read like uh, motivational quotes, like some from um, Muhammad Ali, different poems about how if you don't think you you can win, you won't. Just all the stuff and all this mindset stuff. And when they started going abroad more and big competitions, I printed them each of them off a pack of all the stuff that I, all the stuff that I used to take. So I put it in with them. Then I wrote an individual thing for each of them <clears throat> and how I thought they could help themselves to believe that I believed in them and to do like mantras if you like in your head, not so much spiritual if they want. I used to go through the same routine every single competition before I went on, read the same stuff over and over again, listen to the same music, 
and then basically lie down and sleep for about 10 minutes before I went on and then get up and go. That was my way of doing it and they pretty much do the same as what I did. Mm. With obviously different alterations for their different personalities, but they all do it and they've all still got the pack and I make sure they take it every single time mm. and they take time to read it before they go on. Tell me about this taking a nap before you compete. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a new one for me. I have I haven't seen that before. I've, I've seen people zone out with headphones, but well, it okay. seems to be more intense than and, and it sounds like you're describing it as relaxing. Yeah, I basically like I do the same for patterns, then for sparring. I do my warm up. I do go through everything. As the competitions grew, the, the timing of things were, were, were much better because sometimes you'd be sitting about for hours and hours not knowing when you were on, but now it's, it's very different. So I used to do my warm-up, get stretched, get ready. So I was ready to go on. Don't get me wrong, I didn't just get up and then go on the mat. I'd get up with a, like, a certain amount of time to prepare, but I was fully ready. So I'd just lie down, listen to music and just try and visualize how it was going to feel to win, how it was going to perform, but just get into a really ra- relaxed state so that it wasn't like tense for hours and hours because that just takes up so much energy. And then my coach or whoever would come and say, right, okay, up you get, warm up again. And then that worked for me. I'm not saying it works for everybody, but I just see people even now warming up for like hours and hours before and you're thinking, you've done all the hard work. You're not going to get any better. All you're going to do is make yourself tired for going on. So mm. I make sure my students do a similar thing, that they're not warming up for hours and hours. To me, it's pointless. Yes, warm up enough so you're not going to injure or you've run through your stuff so you feel mentally ready so that you step on the mat just raring. I don't know if you know the word raring to go. It's a Scottish word means you're just ready, you're on fire, and you, yeah. get the adre- you get the adrenaline pumping so that when you step on that mat, you just feel the adrenaline rise from your toes to the top of your head. Mm. And I, I teach mine to do that. So you always used to stand it off the mat, and as soon as I step my feet on the mat, I would just make myself have this adrenaline that I was ready. Adrenaline can be pretty powerful, for sure. Massively. Yeah. I think that's how I... I got through a lot of my really bad injuries and because adrenaline is a wonderful thing. <laughs> it can take that <laughs> it can take that pain away until until the next day and then you can't walk. Right. Right. But the job's done, so maybe you don't need to walk as well. The much. job's done. So then yeah. you can just get carried about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You've acknowledged a few people as we've been talking today, instructors and coaches. Who's been the person that's had the most influence on who you are today as a martial artist? That's a tough one because I have a lot of people outside the martial arts world that have helped me. And I think people can guide you to help you be the person you are today, but they can't make you the person you are. It's, I think that's something that comes from deep within, and sometimes it just takes special somebody or just a few words from somebody to bring that out in you so I couldn't really say that there was one only one person or one set person I think everybody in my life has a different chapter that's helped me in different ways hmm. I mean my best my best friend's still in Taekwondo and we, we've been best friends since we were 16 and she's been a massive influence on the the way I am and the way I perceive myself to be I mean she didn't have quite a long career as I did, but she was always so supportive after she stopped and was always there for me. And I think she's probably had one of the the biggest impacts in my, my Taekwondo life. I can certainly understand, you know, not being able to name one person or, or, or even a few people. When I think about who I am as a martial artist, it's, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm a quilt. I mean, there are just so many people who contributed and, you know, you pull any one of them out and the, the whole thing seems to kind of fall apart. So I, I, I get that. But what if we were to include somebody in the list that, that isn't there now? If you could train with anybody anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, so for some listeners, this is their favorite question. Who would you want to train with? Oh, 
I think if I had another time to train with the General Choi, that would be incredible. Obviously, he passed away a good few years ago now, but I was thankful enough I got to do some seminars with him, and I just I found him just humble and just the way he spoke, the way he held himself. And I was thankful enough he awarded me my first world title, and I remember him com coming off and he said, oh, the Scottish Rose has won. That's all he said. And I remember that also there's uh, Grandmaster Lan in our group. Uh, he's just, he reminds me a lot of uh, General Choi, the way he conducts himself. He's very humble and spiritual, and he manages to pass on a message without having to say too much. It just it just shows him the way he holds himself the, with what he does say is meaningful and it's very Buddha-like, if you can mm. understand that. Yeah. And I just find that very calming and I have a massive amount of respect for him. Mm. Let's shift gears a little bit. You know, people in the martial arts tend to either be very passionate about martial arts movies or they don't watch them at all. <laughs> uh, where, where, where are you? I'm the latter. Yeah. Why? I don't watch them. I just, I've never found them. They just don't, they don't interest me, to be quite honest. I mean, I, I, I was watching John Wick the other night and I quite like the, the fight scenes in that, but I think I like the fight scenes more than the actual choreograph, like the martial arts, if you like. Hmm. I know it might, might sound a little bit strange, but that's that's the way I am. <laughs> well, it, yes and no. It, it's it's strange only if you assume that all martial artists love martial arts movies. And one of the things we've learned over the last few years is that not everyone does. I did uh, like a, I did like Kung Fu Panda. That was quite fun. <laughs> a fun movie for sure. Yeah, yeah there's there, there's a there's a little bit more philosophy in there than than maybe great choreography. Uh -huh. I think of, and I think. Things that I watch, I like. The, I like them to have a meaning, so that if I've watched a movie or something, I go, "Hmm, right, that's." It gives you fodder for thought. Yeah. How about books? Yes, I'm reading Michelle Obama's autobiography at the moment. I think she's a very inspirational woman, and I just love watching her. Do you think she's so motivational? For not just men, but obviously, especially women. And I find that really interesting. Uh, I like to read autobiographies or I just read a silly chick flick book that I can just take myself away and not even think about life. So I have two, two extremes and the same with movies. I <laughs> like silly, funny movies or quite a, like John Wick or series like that, like uh, yeah. crime and thrillers. Yeah. So I've very adverse tastes and pretty much everything in my life. What's the martial arts, uh, I, I guess I'm going to use the word scene, for lack of a better word, in Scotland? Because I'm, I'm racking my brain and apologies to anyone if I am forgetting them. We, we've had a lot of guests. I think you're our first guest from Scotland. Well, I was the first world title holder for females in Scotland, so that's the, that makes two titles then, first ever. <laughs> Uh, one of them, I think, is a little more significant than the other. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've done, I've, I've done a couple of radio shows before a long time ago, but I always like doing these things because it does make you realise what you have achieved. And to get asked to do something from America is, is a, it's a great honour for me. I mean, I've been fortunate enough when I have, when I retired, I got asked to do seminars, I've done seminars in Canada, Philadelphia, Norway, loads of times. I've been fortunate enough to be asked to go over to these places. So that was another good stepping stone after I retired, and it filled the void a little bit, if you like. Mm. And are you still teaching seminars? Uh, not, not so much. I've not done so much after my second hip replacement, to be honest. I have been asked, but it was my choice. Um, with a full-time gym, traveling quite a lot for competitions, I decided that, not that it wasn't for me anymore, but I wasn't enjoying it because I wasn't physically able to do the stuff that I wanted to do. Um, I have to, I mean, I could still do a lot, but I have to be pretty careful into how much impact I put on the hips. Yeah, that makes sense. So I like, I like to do more kind of like motivational speaking and like that, that side of it, 
to help people to realise it's not just the physical they need to work on. But not, not just in Taekwondo, I've done talks to various different communities and girls and about how to be how to be a strong woman, how to be confident and not to put up with bullying. That's that's one thing I'm quite passionate about is um is bullying. I have helped a lot of my students who have been bullied or are being bullied at school, which I just I just can't comprehend it how people can treat other people the way that some of the stories I've heard and what I've been through myself. Right. So and I was going to connect that back that you said you experienced some of that yourself. Yeah, it was, I had a horrendous time, at, especially high school, um, primary school. When I was like 11, obviously I was a little bit overweight. And of course, the taunts from the boys came and that affected me really badly because I didn't even think I was overweight until this boy who was actually overweight said to me I was. And I went home in tears to my mum and it was just awful. And from then, training, lost weight. In high, secondary school, I still don't know why I got bullied. I got bullied. I got called some quite dark skinned and black hair, and people used to call me racist names and things. But I'm, I'm Scottish through and through. And then because I was quite popular, that they didn't like that either. So they just relentlessly picked on me like all day, every day. Mo- mostly just name calling. It wasn't so much the physical side, but. A lot of the time, I think um, the mental aspect of bullying can be more harmful than the actual physical. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a challenge everywhere, you know, and it's a oh. challenge that that we in the martial arts seem to have some some really good tools to address. And I'm glad to see that that there are a lot of schools that are addressing it head on and talking about it. it makes me really happy to see. And it's uh, strange to say this, but I've also been bullied in the, the in the Taekwondo world over the years because obviously I was a high female profile that um, everybody around the world knew. And some people, unfortunately, weren't so keen on that and they tried to make my life pretty bad in a lot of ways, which I won't go into because okay. that caused a lot of, a lot of stress. Um, it's pretty much over now, but I'm always I'm always aware of these people that I don't, I just try and stay away from, don't have much contact with. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's something that does continue to exist. And and we've heard stories, you know, I, I hate to call it adult bullying, but, mm. you know, I, I call it that only because when we talk about bullying, people tend to think of children, but bullying, unfortunately, continues. And sometimes the impact of it is a little more subtle, and sometimes it's far worse. Couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. And not many people know the 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 whole situation of uh, what happened here. But like I said, I just worked so hard with the people and my students and my colleagues that that doesn't happen to anybody else. And if I can do anything to help, then I absolutely will. I remember one time, the first time I won the world title. I know I keep going back to it, but because I got so much publicity from it, from papers, like radio, everything, I was pretty well known. And, and a lot of, I uh, hate to say it, but males and were pretty jealous of it. And I remember coming back at the first tournament and everybody, most people were like, oh, that was great. I'm so proud of you. That's well done. And there was these two guys came up to me and went, so you won it once. You won it, did you? And I went, yeah, I did. And instead of saying congratulations to me, they said, well, it's anybody can win it once. And they walked away from me. And I was gobsmacked. And I just thought, right, okay, I'm not going to let this ruin my celebrations. And I remember seeing them years later. And I'd won it, uh, had I won it five or six? I can't remember. I think it was five times by then. And I saw them. And I went straight up to them. I said, is, is five enough for you now? And I just walked away. And I, they were just gobsmacked. They didn't even know what to say. And I thought, yeah, you won't you won't put me down like that again. How did it feel in that moment? I felt ecstatic. Because <laughs> I remember the feeling I had the first time when they said that to me, because it was in front of other people as well. It wasn't just me. And I was embarrassed. I'd lost my tongue. I didn't know what to say. So I didn't want to seem like argumentative or conceited. So I just didn't say anything. 
but it always stuck right in the back of my mind. Mm. It's funny, it's, I always found it funny because Scottish and British mentality, I think, is <clears throat> very different from the likes of America or Canada. That if you have somebody in your country that does something that nobody else has done or they win Olympics or a world title or whatever, it's like they want to put them down instead of build them up. And I just can't understand that mentality at all. So I've never been, been like that. If somebody wins and they've worked hard and they deserve it, I'm the first one to congratulate. So I know how hard it takes to achieve like, your goal or your dream and to get put down or not get the accolade that you think you possibly should have got. It's really hurtful, especially in your own country. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that. Let's switch gears to the future. You know, when you look out over the next year, five years, 20 years, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, firstly, I hope I'm still alive. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's a good step one. <laughs> yeah, since, um, well, since retiring and building the gym, the, the last couple of years, um, I've done a lot more traveling for myself um, because I spent so many years seeing countries that I never really saw. It was sports center, hotel. And when I became single, after a long time with my ex-partner, I decided to, to start traveling myself. And all my friends were married. They couldn't go on holiday. So the first trip I went on myself, I went to Thailand myself for two weeks. And I hated every single minute of it. The country was beautiful, but I was alone. I didn't join any groups. I tried to go on trips. But it was all couples and they weren't interested. So I came back from that thinking, okay, what can I do to meet uh, new people, like-minded people who want to travel a country? So I've done various trips now with a group called Intrepid Travel, which is Australian-based, but it's worldwide. And you basically go on this trip. The first one I went to was uh, Borneo, and they have a guide, and you see the whole of the country in two weeks. It's all the rustic side of it. And I've met some amazing people who have actually one from Australia, one from England, who I went to Sri Lanka with in Guatemala. And this year I was in Costa Rica and Panama. So that now is probably my biggest passion, apart from obviously my school. Mm. I tried to spend so many years, well, international competing for 20 years. I figured it's time, time for myself to see the world and get out there. I love cultures, I love countries. I love snorkeling. I just love nature. And it's when I do trips like that, I feel free. I don't feel like Julia Cross. I, think one, I don't feel like this Cross, the instructor. I feel like Julia, who's, that's who I am. Uh, but the people I've met on these trips are just met some of the best, best people out with Taekwondo who've taught me a lot about life. Everybody has their own story. And I find other people's stories fascinating. And it's always funny when they find out what I do because I don't ever tell them what I do or what I've achieved until my friend decides to tell them after a few beers. And then, but they find it amazing, but it's, I'm just that person. It's not, and I don't want to feel special with them. I don't want to feel, I just love just being me and having fun and, like I said, just being free. So if people want to find you, if they want to find you online, um, social media, your gym, anything like that, where would they go? Well, on Facebook is South Queen's Ferry TKD, South Queen's Ferry Taekwondo. And on uh, we have a website, which is South Queen's Ferry TKD.info. Um, we can find a lot of stuff there. And with um, my private life, I have a private Facebook page that, to be honest, that people really can't find me. They can probably Google it. But um, I get friends across from all over the world pretty much every day. And I'm very one that if I don't know somebody, I won't have them on my private page because that's for me. As it should be. Yep. Definitely. I'm not one. For, I'm not a huge one for spreading my life out about what I do. The club Facebook page all, all the time we have post stuff about what we're doing. Or for example, we had a quiz night on Saturday to raise funds for the European Championships, and we had a, about fifty parents and students came up. And it was just great. And one of my other students ran it. And we raised like £350 to help towards expenses. That's going back to the, the, the family unit. The, we all support each other mm. in every, everything we do. 
It's great. It's great. Well, I appreciate you being here and I'm going to ask you for one final favor. Ask every guest this. What parting words, what final advice or wisdom or whatever you want to call it, would you offer up to the listeners today? To never stop believing in yourself. If you have a goal, make a, make a plan, start to put that plan in place and never, never stop until you achieve it. But also never be scared to ask for help. And I think that's an important one because you can't do anything alone. Believe in yourself, believe in other people. And if you fall down, don't stay down. Just keep getting back up. And if you fall, you get back up. Because the people that get back up the most, I think, are the, the true winners in life. Whether it be a gold medal, whether it be getting back after a hip replacement, but just not giving up on yourself. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. There was a lot in this episode for me to unpack, personally. The idea of pushing yourself, the idea of finding the space to remain humble and and know who you are despite success. These are all things that really clicked, that resonated for me, and I hope they did so for you. So thank you, Ms. Cross, for joining us on the show and sharing so much of your past. If you want to learn more, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com episode 442. Find the transcript, the photos, links, all kinds of stuff for this and every other episode we've ever done. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. And if you want to support the show, you can make a purchase. Use the code podcast15. You can share this or another episode. You can leave us a review on the Apple iTunes store, Facebook, Google, all over the place. Anywhere you can leave a review. We'd appreciate that. And if you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 